In this video, we're gonna be talking about applying hyperbaric oxygen for those diagnosed on the autism spectrum. And is it appropriate to use hyperbaric for these children? And if so, what should that protocol look like? And what types of pressures and percentages of oxygen should we be considering? And ultimately, what type of effects might we be expecting when applying hyperbaric oxygen in these particular cases? That's what we'll cover in this video. It's really important when we talk about hyperbaric oxygen applied off-label that we also recognize the fact that hyperbaric is not a cure or a treatment for any of those conditions that we're talking about. We're going to be talking about hyperbaric oxygen applied to children diagnosed on the autism spectrum. And so, again, it's a very fragile conversation with regard to the fact that we have to understand that hyperbaric oxygen is not a treatment for autism. Do we apply it to children diagnosed on the autism spectrum? Absolutely. Do we see certain benefits? Yes, but it is not a direct treatment for this particular condition. So understanding that, when I teach the courses that we teach and we talk about off-label use of hyperbaric, we still have to make sure that the decisions we're making to apply a therapy off-label are appropriate. And we do that by understanding what we call the pathophysiology. What is the issue associated with whatever condition that we're talking about? What's the physiology? of this issue. What are the mechanisms of action of hyperbaric oxygen? What sort of benefits or changes on a physiological level do we see using hyperbaric? And now, does it make sense to apply these mechanisms of action to these known issues associated with this condition? If it makes sense, then we should be applying the therapy. And if it doesn't make sense, then of course we should not apply the therapy. So we go through a rationale and a mechanisms of action and then a patient selection criteria to understand how to come to that decision. So what are some of the things we know about autism? A few things. Number one, in some circles, they're looking at autism as a type of autoimmune, basically a neurological autoimmune issue. Some are calling it an autoimmune encephalitis, meaning literally an autoimmune condition causing inflammation in the brain. We also know that there are certain issues associated with autism spectrum like reduced perfusion to the temporal lobe of the brain, literally meaning reduced oxygen delivery to the temporal lobe, also reduced oxygen delivery to the prefrontal cortex. Roughly about 70 to 75% of children diagnosed on the autism spectrum have reduced perfusion to those areas of the brain. The temporal lobe specifically is the language center of the brain. And the prefrontal cortex is in charge of things like behavior and executive function. And so we can start to see behavioral changes, executive function issues, and developmental delay with regard to language in many children diagnosed on the autism spectrum as a result of those issues. We also know that there's typically chronic inflammation within these children and a general issue in terms of gut-brain connection. So amongst other things, is it appropriate to apply hyperbaric? Let's just say for those that I've mentioned so far. And so I would say the answer is yes. We know that whether it's actually an autoimmune condition or not, there is this generalized inflammation. We also know that hyperbaric is amazing at reducing the cytokine response from an inflammatory standpoint. It increases the anti-inflammatory cytokines in our body. It decreases the inflammatory cytokines in our body. It also increases the regulatory cytokines, the cytokines that are trying to balance our immune system. So in three different ways, it helps to control inflammation. So if we have a disease or a condition that's inflammatory in nature and hyperbaric reduces inflammation, that would be a win in this category. We are on a mission to make sure that the people looking for this information have access to it. I know that there's a lot of content out there, and I know that it could be very confusing when people are trying to find the answers that they're looking for, and it's really important for me that those people can find these answers. So when you like it, when you subscribe, and when you share these videos, that helps the people looking for this content know that they're getting a trustworthy source and they're getting the information that they're trying to find. So please do that and help us help other people. Next, there's a general hypoperfusion. Well, we know for sure that hyperbaric will affect that two different ways. Number one, in the short term, just by being inside of a chamber, you are massively increasing the oxygen delivery to literally every cell and tissue in the body. Of course, that would include the brain. But in the long term, it's also going to cause angiogenesis, which is a remodeling or rebuilding of capillary beds. So if in this case we have hypoperfusion, and maybe some of that hypoperfusion is due to 
not enough capillaries in an area to deliver enough oxygen, well, in the short term, we can deliver higher levels of oxygen. And in the long term, we can build and develop new capillary beds so that when we stop the therapy, we have the capillary network necessary to continue to oxygenate that tissue for the long term. Well, hyperbaric will help in both of those two different ways. And then next, in terms of gut health and gut balance, well, we also know that hyperbaric has a tendency to nourish the microbiome. Most of the microbiome, the healthy bacteria in our gut, are either oxygen-loving, they want more oxygen, or at least oxygen-tolerant, meaning you can be in a higher oxygen environment and those bacteria would still thrive and do well, versus most pathogens, most bacteria that are going to cause us problems and infections are anaerobes, meaning they don't like oxygen. They don't function well in a high oxygen environment. And so adding oxygen to that environment will, one, nourish the good bacteria, the healthy microbiome, and number two, put pressure on the unhealthy bacteria in a way that would make it more difficult for them to thrive. So here's another way that hyperbaric may help with children diagnosed on the autism spectrum. So is it appropriate to apply hyperbaric to these children? Absolutely, the answer is yes. Those are a few of the mechanisms, not all of them, but that's the rationale and the mechanisms that are acting on these children and why we see such changes. What types of changes might we see? Well, parents report things like improved expressive language as well as receptive language. We often see improved socialization and improved behaviors. One of the first things that many families report, improved sleep patterns, which is often reported within days of even the first few sessions. One of the reasons I think that we see the improved sleep pattern is because hyperbaric has this parasympathetic benefit. In other words, there's two sides to the nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is that stress drive, fight or flight. Parasympathetic is more the rest and digest and recovery side. And so if we can stimulate parasympathetic activity, we can often see improvements in digestion, again, gut health, but also in sleep hygiene. And so while we're always careful to make sure that we're not making claims that we're treating autism or anything else off-label, we do often see that parents are reporting such great changes, such as the ones I just mentioned. And therefore, we do continue to offer hyperbaric as a solution for families looking for relief with children diagnosed on the autism spectrum. So now that we're talking about whether or not it's appropriate, and I think we're deciding that, yes, it is appropriate to consider hyperbaric as part of a solution. Again, not in a vacuum by itself. There's a lot of different pieces of this that need to come together simultaneously. But what kind of protocols might you consider when applying hyperbaric in this way? There's a wide range of therapy potentials. And while there is absolutely some research on using hyperbaric oxygen for children diagnosed on the autism spectrum, those protocols are also varied. So we've used anything from mild pressures at around 1.3 air only, and we've seen certain benefits from that. And we've used one and a half atmospheres on 100% oxygen, and we've seen some benefits from that. We've really never gone above 1.5 unless there were other issues that we were trying to help resolve. But typically between 1.3 to 1.5 is the range of pressure, and between 21% oxygen or air only, so to speak, up to 100% oxygen we've used. In a case where we could do 1.5 atmospheres on 100% oxygen, we're looking at a minimum of at least 40 hours as an initial protocol. And then in many cases, there will be subsequent protocols to build on over time. Where 1.3 air only is being used, those protocols are much larger. They're more 80 hours to 100 hours as initial protocols. And then again, we build protocols out from there. What's really important to know is you shouldn't be taking this on if you're a patient or family, this isn't something you should be taking on by yourself. This is something you really need to be talking to people who actually do this consistently with patients because we understand exactly when those breaks need to be taken, when we should be pushing through certain layers, when we need to start putting more sessions closer together, when we should be starting to separate those sessions further apart. So I'm giving you an idea of protocol, but that's really more for you to understand the range. I do feel very strongly that you're working with somebody who's trained in using hyperbarics in this way so that they could help formulate what those protocols really need to look like. I hope this helped answer some of the questions with regard to, is it appropriate to apply hyperbarics for these children and what kinds of changes we might expect as a result. As always, thanks again for watching. See you next time. Whether you're a chiropractor or a naturopath 
or an acupuncturist, or a DO, or even an MD, but you're looking at hyperbarics through this lens, the lens that I'm describing, which is applying hyperbarics for all these off-label conditions, this is the class that teaches that. And right now it's the only class that teaches this type of hyperbarics in this way, and that's an actual certification course. Check out hbotusa.com, and uh, right across the, the top you'll see upcoming events. You can click on that and it'll show you uh, when our next courses are gonna be.